So we, this podcast is talking about like emerging technology. So perhaps you can give us some like new stuff that's coming. Is it, I, I'll just so, throw some random stuff out. Like 6G, is that even on the horizon or is, is 5G still being rolled out? What's happening sort of with the emerging technologies? Actually, we found out one of the big car manufacturers was relying on a supplier of uh, uh, delivering the, the keyless uh, access to their, to their cars. And uh, uh, our service uh, automatically blocked access to that because the machine that was sitting behind that service had a vulnerability. Immediately, uh, 100,000 connections got dropped. So people were trying to unlock their cars, People right? were trying to unlock their cars and weren't able to do it. So uh, via the phone <laughs> and uh, yeah. Everyone, David Bumble back with a very special guest. Niklas, welcome to the show. Thanks, David, for having me. Great to have you here. And you work for a very interesting organization. And I was going to say T-Mobile, but perhaps you can tell us exactly how that works. So it's Deutsche Telekom. Sounds a bit strange. It's kind of the German telecoms operator. And T-Mobile is actually one of our companies that is included in that group. So how many customers does Deutsche Telekom have? Oh, wow. Globally, we have uh, about 240 million mobile subscribers and another couple of dozen million broadband subscribers. And it's worldwide, right? Yeah, so it's worldwide. It's uh, Germany, some other European countries, and the Atlantic. So we like to think of ourselves like being the number one telco in the Western Hemisphere. So 240 million, did you say? Yes. Handsets around the world. So that's a huge infrastructure that's supporting that. And I've got two big things to start off with. Um, we'll get to AI later. But like networking and security are two massive, um, I'm, I'm assuming, areas that you know consume a lot of your time, perhaps. Absolutely. I mean... Networking is the core of our business. That's where we come from. And security, you know, may have been starting off from a different angle and be being, a, let's say, adjacent business to what we do. Now it's fully integrated into the core of our business. And uh, we like to provide the benefits that come along with uh, security services to our core business, to networking. And I can definitely share a bit more about no, that. Go for it. So don't stop. Keep going. <laughs> so... In the end, what customers want from us is a net network that just works wherever exactly. they are and when they're at home, that it's stable and just works for every use case that they have, right? And so what we've been doing as we designed that product of security on net is making sure that we, you know, basically place that security enforcement point directly next to our network core, obviously, right? And thereby, we ensure that it comes without, or let's say, a very limited latency impact and are able to provide our customers that service without any further interruption. On top of that, you know, how do you make cybersecurity visible to customers? It's actually pretty difficult. And even and if you include it into the network, even more so, right? Yep. So we've thought about that quite a bit. And therefore, uh, the, the experience that you will have is when you click on one of those phishing links or you open up a malicious website, you get that big, beautiful Magenta T logo, and it will tell you that this is one of the websites where we think you would be under attack. It gives you some explanation. It can give you some further information, and you will be prompted to another uh, website that op that offers you some training capabilities and stuff like that to ensure if you are in a business context, for example, and you're a small business owner, that you can you know, suggest your employees to also increase that human firewall element that you need to make sure you're uh, sufficiently secured against cyber threats. So, I mean, this solution that you're talking about is not just for employees of Dejic Telecom, it's actually your customers as well. Absolutely. It's an external product that we include directly into our mobile terrace. Uh, we've done that uh, beginning of this year already. Uh, I can share that, uh, you know, in Germany alone, we have already a higher six-digit number of customers wow. on it, a higher seven digit number of uh, actual cases where we've protected customers from opening up phishing or malicious websites. So even if you take out, you know, the the audience from your from your from your show here, which would try to break the service, I think already a significant number of real cases where we've protected customers from the risks that they would have otherwise have had. And um, now we're bringing it out to all our broadband customers beginning of next year as well. I've got to say this, right? Whenever I post videos on YouTube, sorry to interrupt you, I always get Germans complaining, in Germany, the internet's terrible. <laughs> you know, you know, Germans tend to have high expectations. That's fine. No, and, uh, and, 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 and jokes aside, um, there's actually, you know, there's actually a good uh, reason to uh, explain at a very rational level why, uh, and that's absolutely fair, Germany hasn't, doesn't have the highest share in full fiber lines as you would have in some other regions. And the reason is pretty simple. The copper network that was built previously, 
was actually pretty good. Yeah. What does that mean? So to give some practical terms, the copper network in Germany allows you to get speeds up to 250 megabits, right? Oh, wow. yeah. So that's pretty, yeah. that's pretty good, that's right? Good, yeah. So yeah. just being honest, the fiber case for getting customers to actually transition is actually pretty difficult. It is, yeah. So obviously, it's without question, fiber is the future and we're building out fiber like hell. Uh, in a 40 million household country, we're building out 2 million households a year. Oh, wow. Uh, and we're even scaling up further than that. But uh, yeah, if you have a decent, good product on the on the copper side, um, then yeah, it, it's, it, it takes a bit time to get customers actually transition to the new technology. So we, this podcast is talking about like emerging technology. So perhaps you can give us some like new stuff that's coming. Is it... I'll just throw some random stuff out. Like 6G, is that even on the horizon or is 5G still being rolled out? What's happening sort of with the emerging technologies? So, yes, yeah, 6G is a topic still, uh, however, obviously for, you know, very early discussions of how it's going to look like. Uh, I think, you know, we see some of the uh, messaging being similar to what we have been discussing, I think, in the 5G world and you just extrapolate that to some extent. And I think with 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 many such technologies and we're probably going to talk about other emerging technologies as well you know adoption is usually the, the thing that comes a bit later yeah. after all the buzzwording has stopped right yeah. and on 5g we see that now right so we are way above that you know uh first uh climax of that hype cycle and now we see real adoption on 5g based services 5g standalone based services for example we've just recently launched a service in uh, germany uh, which is called T-Mission. You have something like uh, like that here in uh, the US already from our uh, T-Mobile uh, subsidiary uh, called T-Priority, which actually provides police and rescue workers with priority on the network when they need it in congestion. Because we know connectivity can save lives and we wanted to do so in those circumstances where you would actually have congestion. And uh, that's absolutely crucial. And it's, it's one of the capabilities that come along with a 5G-enabled network. And uh, others as well, uh, when I think about uh, slicing capabilities and so on. And obviously, apart from uh, 5G, um, other uh, you know technologies to provide uh, uh, connectivity ubiquitously uh, play a bigger and bigger role. We all uh, are aware of what happens in us using satellites yeah, and, and, yeah. and other <laughs> non-terrestrial platform yeah. p- platforms for connectivity. And uh, for us, we see that as a big enhancement to actually fulfill on that promise of ubiquitous connectivity and uh, at the same time uh, as as you will find i think in in many different regions you know it it, it will play a different role in different regions across the world uh, so give you to give you an understanding germany is a smaller country than the us it has uh, to some extent an easier topography it has easier uh, uh, population density and if you, if you want so uh, from a network engineering point of view and therefore area coverage not talking pop coverage but area coverage in germany uh, is way above 90 percent depending on the on the actual technology and therefore satellite will help us you know to really close those very last tiny spots but in other areas and in the us it can play obviously a bigger role because it's such a huge country and it will never be beneficial to build out towers everywhere like if you're in a national park in the u.s or in certain states in the u.s i mean there's very few people and huge areas so is satellite the next area where cell phones will be connected to satellite like i won't mention names but i'll just throw it out here because a lot of people talk about starlink like is this the the trend where cell phones will now use satellites in the future yeah i mean we see it already right it's it's uh satellite usage is available for messaging for first emergency uh, and so on so we see that uh, building up, uh, and I think it's absolutely fair to assume that uh, when you know we get more innovation in terms of you know what form factors can actually support satellite connectivity and how much energy usage it actually has and so on, that you will see further services uh, you know transitioning to uh, a satellite as well as a support or backup uh, uh, connectivity on the move, and in some cases obviously also at at at, at fixed locations where it will never be beneficial to build a, f- uh, a fiber line. So we we very much see that as complementing the connectivity that we already provide on mobile and uh, and fixed to make sure that we fulfill on that promise connecting everyone. So you said there were some other emerging technologies that you could mention. So give us an idea of what's coming. What else is coming? I think we've already talked about something on uh, security. We've already yeah. talked about uh, T-mission priority for our yeah. rescue workers and police. 
Uh, uh, another one that I can mention is obviously we want to make sure that we, you know, not only provide best connectivity and secure connectivity, what we already talked about, but also intelligent. So how do we make that network intelligent? I think the the key thing about uh, AI and actually, wow, the first time we mentioned yeah, so AI, it's, this, it's pretty late in the podcast, right? yeah, exactly. pretty late in the in the in the interview. Yep, but uh, actually, AI can enable us also to make the connectivity smart, right? And make the network smart. We've been talking about, and telcos have been talking about, making their networks, you know, intelligent and branching out into new businesses for quite some time. AI actually gives us some capabilities, not only the security side, but other others as well. Imagine you're a small business owner. And imagine you need to, you know, manage all the uh, all the meetings that you do, all the you know contracts, uh, and 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 you're you're hooking up with a customer, and you want you you need to go there. All of that on your own. There's a very simple product that we've included into our uh, voice tariffs, which is called AI Notes. And basically, what it simply what it does, it will listen in to the phone call that you will have, yep. and when you agree on a meeting, it will directly add it to your diary, right? So you can save time and actually focus on the customer that you have. Um, and capabilities like that, and it's just a small example, will allow us, and it's actually something that only we as a telecoms operator can do directly out of the network, directly yep. out of the voice or data services, can enable us to make that, that network intelligent to bring valuable benefits to our customers. So where are things going? Where do, where do you see things going, like emerging technologies? What are, what are other new technologies that you're seeing? How is it going to change our lives? I mean, AI is the rage at the moment. What kind of stuff are you seeing? So what kind of stuff am I seeing? So when it comes to connectivity, uh, first of all, yes, uh, as already mentioned, networks become more secure directly out of the network. Networks become more intelligent, intelligence directly out of the network. So those are things that we see. And also connectivity becomes more ubiquitous and uh, I believe another trend will be more embedded. So we're working uh, very much on making sure when we talk about IoT that the connectivity that we provide is just embedded in the products that that we all sell, uh, that we all buy uh, to connect to uh, services. If you think about an intelligent uh, washing machine, dishwasher, whatever, today these many of these uh, uh, promises of, you know, let's talk smart home or other technologies have actually not played out in, in every market. Why? Because it's a hassle for customers, you know, to connect these devices over Wi-Fi. Maybe they just need to, maybe they need to set it up. Maybe, you know, you, 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 you ask somebody who is not dealing with all of that, you know, to set up such a device and punch in the 32 character Wi-Fi <laughs> password or whatever. <laughs> so we see us in, 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 in the position to make that much easier. So we're talking to a lot of OEMs and make sure, hey, you cannot only build a Wi-Fi chip in, why not also build the 5G modem in? And by the way, it comes directly with an eSIM from Dodger Telecom. It doesn't cost anything, but when the customer wants that additional service that come along with a smart home device, it's just a push of a button away, right? And so that's how we think about embedding connectivity, the cellular connectivity that is ubiquitous anyway, directly uh, uh, into uh, uh, all the appliances that we uh, uh, that we use. I'm glad you mentioned that because I've heard this as well, where so the 5G um, SIM will be directly in a washing machine or in a fridge, all these appliances, and they won't need to be connected to Wi-Fi. They'll just go straight onto the cellular network, right? Correct. So, and that, as said, right, that makes it, it's not just, you know, another technology or another form of transmission, it makes it much easier and uh, quickly available to the end customer. And from a from a from uh, from an OEM point of view, uh, adoption becomes much easier, right? Because we see it uh, uh, definitely in some of the European markets where, where we're in, that adoption is the big the big issue on that, right? Because it's just, it just is a hassle, right? To set these things up and the to, to enable them with a push of a button is is a is a promise to get uh, adoption up uh, for for OEMs and at the same time for customers to make it easier to to use uh, 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 the possibilities that come along with having that household appliance connected to the internet. I mean that's a great thing to talk about. It's like so at home people are going to see their devices connected without Wi-Fi, just going straight onto the cell phone network or the cellular network. Phones will just increase. It, you just see more and more devices getting added to the network, right? I mean, Germany are well known for manufacturing, love BMW, Mercedes, etc. Um, do we just see more and more devices, uh, cars, etc., being connected? Yes, we do. I mean, it's it's astronomical, right? So uh, 
we see that and that's uh we talked about scale previously yeah that's the challenge obviously that we need to keep up with right so um we need to make sure that you know the networks are built for for for, for that purpose because it's not just bandwidth and latency right think about today where you would have millions uh in the future would have tens or hundreds of millions of devices which are all creating some form of traffic singling traffic as well and so on so so networks need to be built for that purpose as well right it's not just you have you need to have the right bandwidth and you need to transmit data efficiently but also just being able you know to to deal with the with a, with the magnitude of devices being connected and that's already a discussion that uh, that we had in the 5G era but uh, 6G is going to be even more about that, right? To handle that massive scale of number of devices uh, being uh, uh, connected. So uh, our our uh, or my personal assumption would be that 6G is is not not that much about pure increase of bandwidth and transmission speeds because we all know in the end there's a physical limit to it when we are in the cellular world and that's why we will always have also fixed networks uh, but more about you know just dealing with that abundance of devices being connected you must come across so many cool stories out there can you at least share one story that like is very interesting yeah maybe one so an interesting story was that you remember i talked about security on net yep. uh, where uh, we protect our customers directly out of the network that comes along with you know obviously inspecting a, a huge amount of traffic and uh, we found out uh, you know that that can lead to you know scale impact so actually we found out one of the big car manufacturers was relying on a supplier of uh, uh, delivering the the keyless uh, access to their to their cars and uh, uh, our service uh, automatically blocked access to that because the machine that was sitting behind that service had a vulnerability. Immediately, uh, 100,000 connections got dropped. So people were trying to unlock their cars, People right? were trying to unlock their cars and weren't able to do it So uh, via the phone. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so, so that was actually one of the uh, more, more, more fun stories. But in the end, I mean... Obviously, uh, 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 that car manufacturer was thankful because we, we we told them that there's a risk in 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 uh, the architecture that they used to provide that service. So that's fantastic. So I mean, there was a vulnerability in the server system that they were using. Your system in the in the cloud, or in in your infrastructure, picked that auto- automatically and then blocked it because of this vulnerability. Correct. And then the net result was people obviously couldn't unlock their cars, but from a security point of view, it was a great thing. Yeah, but you pointed it out correctly right from a security point of view apps everything right you know from a providing connectivity point of view <laughs> a it's difficult one so so it can show you you know the you know the, the the respect that you need to bring to actually treating with such services at that large scale yeah that's a good point because i think a lot of us like if you work at, at home who cares you're going to block your own home network or in an enterprise you might be blocking hundreds maybe a few thousand but you're blocking like a huge amount of uh connections if you if you implement something so you've got to give us a story perhaps if you were talking to your younger self or to someone who wants to get into networking or what you're doing work in the in 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 the uh, uh, telco what's your advice my advice would be uh uh i mean first as always you know follow whatever interests you and uh, if you feel that you know you like technological change you know you like to be paid for getting educated on new technologies all the time and you like to work in an area which is super relevant for the society and the backbone, or, and is the backbone of the economy, then uh, you can definitely choose uh, telecoms, and uh, it's a it's it's a great industry to be in. And uh, I would just uh, tell everyone: uh, make sure you are acquainted with all the technologies that you uh, talk about on your uh, channel, uh, the capabilities that come along with. Uh, AI, but you know, tied to you know the exact or the other real benefits that it brings to uh, uh, customers and organizations uh, beyond the pure buzzwording. I must say, this is like a record. We only had a small section on AI. So, <laughs> <laughs> Nicholas, thanks so much. Appreciate your time. Thank you. 